We have an extraordinary guest speaker today. He is an innovational guru who could speak hours about the future of companies and the challenges that await them. Please welcome Peter Henson. Thank you. Hello, Peter. Great you could make it. Tell me, in this future you like to talk about so much, where do you see me? Honestly, Tommy, um, I hate to disappoint you, but I think in a few years you'll probably be as obsolete as a uh, Commodore 64. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, wow, not the greatest motivational talker, are you? The floor is all yours. Thank you, Tommy. Good afternoon. Um, it's a pleasure to be with you. Um, and it's quite new for me to speak to an audience who've all received my book. Um, I, I can only hope yet you didn't read it because then I don't know what I'm going to talk about. Um, but I want to talk about um, what I see happening, um, about a future, about how technology is changing it, and, and honestly about the role that you play. And one of the strange things about looking into the future is it, it always seems to happen. And the necessity to think about this, this need for innovation, seems to be going faster and faster. And this is something that I think is fascinating. Many of you understand technology, you feel technology, you sell technology, but you live in a world where technology becomes more and more relevant. But still, there are plenty of people out there who don't see the real advantages. This is um, one of my favorite ads, um, 100 years old. And somebody who was selling horses in New York took the time and the effort to put an advertisement in the newspaper to convince people that cars were a really bad idea and that you should absolutely keep on buying horses. And 100 years later, we think this is stupid. But in honestly, there are plenty of people out there who don't see the real advantages of some of the things that we're going to talk about today. People say, well, we seem to be in a world that's going faster and faster. And I'm not really sure if that is true. Uh, people say, we can't cope with the change. I'm not sure that is true either. I think humans are really good at coping with change. If you look at what happened to us, just 300 years ago, we had the social revolution, which the French insist on calling the French Revolution, but they're French. It was really interesting that this basically changed society into society as we have it today. 150 years ago, we had the Industrial Revolution, and that really changed companies into companies as we have them today. And now we're in an environment where technology is going to change it all again. This is one of my favorite images. This is the President Clinton with his sidekick Al Gore, who invented the internet, laying cables in a school in 1998. That's only 20 years ago. And they were connecting schools to the internet. So the question is, are we really in a time that is too difficult for humans? I don't think you. But are we in a world that is changing faster than ever before? I absolutely believe we are. I have um, a strange life. I, s I live in Belgium. Um, I spend three months a year in Silicon Valley. And I really take a lot of Europeans to Silicon Valley. This is something that started out as a hobby and now becomes more and more of a job. And last week I was there um, with a group of European senior executives. And we fly them into Silicon Valley on Sunday. And they wake up on Monday morning with a severe jet lag at 3 o'clock in the morning. And what do you do when you wake up in your hotel room at 3 o'clock in the morning? You do email. That's about the only thing you can do. And by 7 o'clock, they've done all their emails, and we show them a whole day of new ideas and new concepts and new startups, and it's fabulous to see that. And at the end of that first day, when we've seen all these amazing things, we often get a lot of messages back. And these messages come from the startups we visited. And almost every single time, there is the same sentence, there were a lot of European questions. And this is now a phenomenon in Silicon Valley, European questions. And European questions are, ya, mar. Hmm? Yes, but, we oui, may. And there is something really good about us Europeans to say, yes, but. And I believe this has a deeply genetic reason. 
I think we are genetically inclined to say yes, but, and that's because we who live in Europe, our ancestors hundreds of years ago were the people that didn't get on the boat. So in a certain way, yeah, we are the descendants of people who didn't dare to take risks. And I think this is fascinating in a world that's changing faster than ever before. Um, two days ago, this is already, in my opinion, the image of the year. Huh? The fact that you had the simultaneous landings of the two booster rockets. And then, of course, the magical moment when you know, the Tesla was shot into space and is now going to be circling the moon for billions of years. I mean, this was science fiction. Years ago, the idea of rockets landing back onto space, and it now becomes a reality. And I'm fascinated by a world that is changing. And sometimes if you look at the small changes, you think it goes very slowly. If you look at the big ones, there are fundamental ones. This is the first tweet from Jack Dorsey in 2006. It's only 12 years old. And this is my favorite image of the last presidential election in the US. And there you see how fundamentally technology has become absolutely normal. We don't even consider it technology anymore. It's just we're always connected. This was the nativity scene at Kerstalletje that you needed to have, where taking a selfie of the baby Jesus is now the most natural thing to do in a world where technology has become absolutely normal. If you announce any changes in your family, you throw it on Instagram. And if you have twins, you might get 10 million likes. Technology isn't special anymore. Technology has become absolutely normal. This is my favorite sad image. What you see is two people in bed, and their faces are illuminated by the shining of their smartphones. And this is your fault. This is basically your fault. You did this. Huh? And, and the irony of this is they're probably talking to each other. Hmm? They're, they're discussing who, who's going to pick up the kids the next day and, and who brings home bread or milk. This is the world where technology has become absolutely normal. I have two kids, they're perfect lenses onto that future. My, my youngest, 14 years old, is a huge game fan. The game he loves the most is Grand Theft Auto, which is one of the most disgusting games ever. Huh? And after the exploding Samsung Galaxies last year, this is the latest incarnation of um, Grand Theft Auto, where next to a grenade, you can pick up an exploding Samsung and then use that in the game to basically <laughs> blow up stuff, right? which is fascinating if you think about it. No? I'm, I'm glad you like it. I, I did a presentation last week, and Samsung was one of the sponsors that didn't like it at all. They, uh, no. But it shows how quickly something that happens in the real world becomes reality. And, and as you probably know, I'm obsessed with the idea of, of S-curves, where technology used to be special and technology becomes normal. And if you look at that world, a lot of the things that are on this slide, social, mobile, cloud, and big data, they were like, wow, a couple of years ago, and now they're just mad, normal. And what I want to do this afternoon is, is really talk about this day after tomorrow, this idea of new things that are accelerating, that are maybe going faster than ever before. And what is the capability that you have to take this as an example and really leverage your potential in that day after tomorrow? And I'm an engineer. I get excited about this. But you know, we now live in a world where if you have children, your children have a, an almost mathematical certainty of becoming 100. Imagine what they will see until the end of their life in terms of technological innovation. And what if we're only in the beginning of that? And it's true, maybe I'm biased by the fact that I spend too much time in Silicon Valley. Someone called Silicon Valley um, 400 square miles surrounded by reality. And that might be a very interesting way to actually look at it. You get naturally high on the optimism. But if you look at the five largest companies on the stock exchange in 2006, the five largest companies were traditional companies, banks and energy companies. If you look at the five largest companies on the stock exchange today, they're all technology companies. And this shows that we're living in a world where today, technology isn't just becoming mainstream, it's becoming dominant. It's becoming a force to be reckoned with. And people say, ah, oh, this is a financial bubble, maybe. But these are the most valuable brands on the planet. And if you look at the top six most valuable brands, 
Only Coca-Cola is a non-tech company in these largest brands in the world. And I think this is interesting. You are basically fundamental in making this happen, but not everybody agrees. Not everybody is so happy about the fact that we now have these big players. One thing is for sure, it's going faster than ever before. And even the word disruption, I mean, I'm an engineer, I get goosebumps even when I hear the word disruption, and I get excited about this. But this is why I love doing a presentation for you guys. Yesterday, I did a presentation for an insurance company, and these people didn't share the same excitement about <laughs> technology as we do. So you get that. But the interesting thing is, we're now seeing that disruption becomes absolutely real. And let me show you an example. This is one of my favorite videos. This is the introduction of the self-driving Uber in San Francisco last year. And two people hail an Uber, and the Uber arrives. It's a self-driving Uber. And they get into the car, in the back seat of the car. And look very closely. This man is very important. His job is to do nothing for eight hours a day. This is a completely new job. He has to psychologically reassure the passengers, because if you get into a driverless car and there's no one, oh, this is scary. So his job is just to calm them down and do nothing. That is the most important thing. This is one of my favorite images. This is a self-driving auto truck, self-driving auto truck, delivering a fleet of self-driving Ubers to where they will be deployed. I have been deeply puzzled by this image because if they're self-driving, why don't they drive themselves to where they have to be deployed? I just, there must be some logistical reason for that. Huh? But even then, as an engineer, you say, wow, this is amazing. A self-driving truck with self-driving cars, wow. This is wow. And this is oui. <laughs> this is the first self-driving Uber crash in Phoenix, um, in Arizona last summer. And an amazing thing happened. The car makes a maneuver. No, the algorithm in the car makes a maneuver. And the guy whose job it is to do nothing panics, takes control of the steering wheel, and bam, crashes into the other car. Your only job is to do nothing for eight hours, and then this happens. Huh? Uber immediately stopped the program. They did the analysis, and after three days came to the conclusion, algorithm correct, human wrong, and they fired the guy. I mean, Im oh, yeah. I mean imagine this story. Yeah? He comes home, he says, I, I got fired. Why? I did something. Wow, I, it's stupid, <laughs> stupid. <huh? laughs> yeah. and, and in my opinion, this is the next 10 years. It's a combination of wow and oi. And in a strange way, yeah, you're going to be responsible for that. And I'm sure if you talk to customers, you will have customers that see the wow, and you'll have customers that see the ui. And I think it's about maybe managing expectations with the wow guys, and it's sharing the belief with the ui guys. And you can only see it's accelerating. Uber, um, the CEO of Uber on Davos said, we'll have the self-driving cars in the summer of 2019 on the streets. They ordered 24,000 Volvos to be put into the program, 24,000 of these self-driving cars. And this is the test area in Pittsburgh, where for the last year and a half, they have been test driving these Ubers. And every possible scenario, every possible weather circumstance, uh, snowstorm, uh, uh, they've tested it all. And it's fascinating, I think, to see that we're going from science fiction to reality faster than ever before. In the same week that Uber said, we're ready, Google, with their Waymo self-driving car, said, oh, we're ready as well. In January, we had the Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas. Toyota showed their e-palette. They want to really show this off at the Tokyo 2020 Olympics, where they have a self-driving autonomous concept that can be used for anything out there in terms of providing mobility as a service. Brilliant. Science fiction becomes reality sooner than ever before. So I get excited. Of course, there will be many people who say, bah, you know, whatever. You know? I'm always reminded of the most depressing book I have ever read. This is a book I hope you never have to read. It's called On Death and Dying. And it's a, a book by Elizabeth Kubler-Ross who described the five stages of grief of people who become terminally ill. 
Denial, anger, bargaining, depression, acceptance. If you get cancer, first you say, denial. No, this, this is not possible. And then you get angry. You say, really? I, I exercised, I jogged, I didn't put mayonnaise up my features, and I get cancer. This is not fair. Huh? And then you start to bargain, and then you have depression, and then you accept. And I think, honestly, if you have customers who are going through digital transformation, this is exactly the same stage as they go through. First, denial. In Belgium, we still have too many companies who are in denial that digital is actually going to mean something. And then we have angry. Look at the taxi drivers who got angry with the Uber drivers. And now the Uber drivers are seeing the self-drivers saying, whoa, 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 what happened there? And they're starting to bargain. I think this is almost like a recipe. And it is almost like some sort of a weather map of which industry gets involved in disruption. Today, it is very clear, finance is one of those big ones. Last year, ING um, announced they were cutting 7,000 jobs because of digital transformation. 7,000 people where the CEO said, we can't reskill them anymore for the age of digital. And he said, I don't like to fire 7,000 people, but if we want to be competitive, then we have to actually make this transformation. And by the way, our competitors aren't the other banks anymore. It's the Amazons of this world who are really the next competitors in the world of finance. Finance is now big. This is one of the dumbest things that happened last year. Deutsche Bank did something really, really stupid. Deutsche Bank invited his their employees to an, an employee event like this, and the CEO said to his employees, in our bank, we have too many employees behaving like robots. Maybe we should replace them by robots, it will be cheaper. And he said, what we had in the past was nice, but it's not necessary for the future. I'm not sure what kind of motivational message he was trying to give to his employees, but it clearly wasn't the right message. And I think we're now getting into a phase where this is happening all over again. Should we be scared? No, we should be realistic. We shouldn't hide the fact. Big news two weeks ago, Carrefour announces massive layoffs, first in France, and then in Belgium. Thousands of people lose their job. And what they do is they said, we missed digital. And we're going to have to reinvent ourselves for the age of digital. And by the way, we're announcing a partnership with Tencent, in my opinion, the most advanced technology company in China. In the world of retail, in the next couple of years, we're going to see a revolution. In the past, we went out to the street to do our shopping, and we would go back home and drink a cup of coffee. Now we do all our shopping online, and we go out to the Starbucks and get a coffee. That's the reality today, that's quite difficult if you're in retail. My favorite moment last year is when Amazon acquired Whole Foods. Whole Foods is a big supermarket, um, 700 stores in the US in prime locations with an excellent clientele. And three months before that, the video of Amazon Go had been shown. We've all seen this video where you have the Uberization of the retail experience. You walk into an Amazon Go, you recognize by your smartphone, you pick off the shelf what you want, you put back what you don't want, and the moment that you need to pay, you don't need to wait in line, you just walk out, like taking an Uber. And you don't have to fiddle with cash or a credit card, you just walk out. And when Amazon announced this, people were puzzled. They said, why does Amazon do that? They're an online retailer, they're an online store. Why are they even doing this? And we realized why when they bought Whole Foods for $13.4 billion. This is the reaction on the stock market, which is fabulous. This is the moment that Amazon announces their acquisition. Their stock went up by 3%. Now, let me do the math. The market value of Amazon is 500 billion. 3% extra is 15 billion. So they buy Whole Foods for 13.4, and the market says, jongens, here's 15 billion, keep the change. Huh? That, was, that was known as a good day in Amazon. Huh? It was not such a good day for the Walmarts and the Costcos and the Targets and the Ahold Deleuze and the Carrefours who dropped 10, 15%. Does it mean that these companies are not worth that much anymore? 
It means that the market doesn't believe that they will be the innovators. Three weeks ago, um, I had a chance to be in a Whole Foods in New York, completely integrated. Amazon is putting all their knowledge of online and their scale into their uh, supermarkets. Of course, the irony was two weeks ago when they finally launched Amazon Go for the general public, um, there were huge waiting lines in front of the store that promises not to have any waiting lines inside, which is you know, ironic, but I, that's probably a temporary thing. Disruption is real, and I think we're going to see an acceleration. This ooey and wow thing always reminds me of that amazing book by Charles Dickens, A Tale of Two Cities. This is a classic of Western literature. This is an amazing book which I have never read, but people tell me it's an amazing book. Huh? But even if you've never read it, everybody knows the opening line, best of times, worst of times. This is wow and ooey. We live in a world where sometimes it's difficult to really predict. We can probably only underestimate. In 1998, 20 years ago, Bill Gates, smart man, was asked to say something visionary about the future, and he said, eventually, everyone's business card will have an email address on it. That was a visionary statement 20 years ago. I mean, listen, today we live in a world where technology has become absolutely normal. Um, everybody feels comfortable with technology. World leaders feel comfortable with technology. Most world leaders feel comfortable with technology. <laughs> a cat can become a sensation on Instagram. I mean, every moment is a technology moment, and we do stupid things. This is an airplane in the US which gets into trouble. The oxygen masks come down, and what's the first reaction? Let's take a selfie. Now, that is really <laughs> stupid behavior. But it's an indication of the fact that technology has become absolutely normal. And what if we're only halfway there? And I come from the old normal. Some of you come from the old normal. And there's no shame in that. My father was in technology. This is an advertisement we had in our house in 1980. I was 11 years old. And they were advertising a 10 megabyte hard disk for $3,495. That was, that was a fortune in 1980. But 10 megabytes? I mean, you make a PowerPoint, it's always more than 10 megabytes. You want to email it, it doesn't go through the email system Immediately, you're frustrated with the losers in your IT department that they can't even do email. That's the evolution in 35 years. And I always show these two clips. In the old days, it was, it was a lot simpler. I mean, in the old days, you would have users, and users didn't understand technology. If you would supply them with new things, they had no idea how to use technology. As a matter of fact, they often had a completely wrong way of using technology, often with disastrous consequences as a result. <laughs> we feel sorry for the guy. We feel sorry for the guy. Huh? He doesn't work at Orange anymore. Um, but I always show the second clip. This is the, the woman who's been out of the office for a long time and has no idea how technology has changed in 20 years. <laughs> and you get the joke. But honestly, if I show this to my children, they don't laugh. They don't know why it's funny. You're the last of the Mohicans who understands this joke. Huh? We're in a world where now technology is hot. You cannot open a business magazine or talk about the celebrity CEOs of technology companies. Tech is really, really tough. When BlackBerry stopped making BlackBerry, Business Week put the BlackBerry on the cover as an ancient Canadian communication tool. Huh? And it was really hip just a few years earlier. And we see crazy things. Zuckerberg buys WhatsApp for $16 billion. And people say, ah, oh, these unicorns, billion dollar valuations. This is going to crash. And it might. I'm old enough. This is a slide from 1999. In 1999, we had the dot-com hype. And all you had to do was put dot-com after your name, and you could claim any value. And we knew what happened. March of 2000, boom, NASDAQ collapses. Dot-com crash. Could it happen in 2018? Probably will. And you know what? Won't make a difference. Because technology has become normal. I was in Italy this summer, where an Italian artist had painted the logos of today onto the things of the past. Where you see the things are disappearing yeah? <laughs> from our landscape. That we 
that we consume content and media in a completely different way. That we live in society and communities in a different way. And I love this, two old ladies, tack, 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 under a Twitter sign. Huh? This is the most natural gesture for the next generation. <laughs> this is what your kids were born to do. Huh? And if I would have told you 10 years ago that you would pick up a piece of glass, swipe your finger and be connected to anyone and any content on the planet, you would have said, he's out of his mind. What if we're only halfway there? And I get excited about that. The only thing for sure is we're going to see many, many stupid things. I'm a huge IoT fan. But maybe sometimes we haven't figured out what the right use cases are. I, I make a collection, I call this the Internet of Stupid Things. And, and I brought a few. This is one of my favorites. This is a, a Dutch company called Hitech. They make walking shoes, navigators, which are Bluetooth paired with your smartphone. If you're in a city where you don't know how to go, you go to Google Maps and it will guide your shoes and the soles will vibrate your toes to go left or right. That is stupid. And, and kind of cool at the same time. Huh? This is a Kerastase. They brought this out last year. This is the, the, the smart connected hairbrush. And every time that you brush your hair, it's filled with sensors that are picking up all the, the vital signs of your hair. And they stream that data to the cloud. In the cloud, they compute an algorithm and then is sent to your companion app. And on your companion app, you can check your hair health score. <laughs> I see people here going, my God, how did I ever survive without knowing my hair health score? This is stupid and kind of cool at the same time. We're going to have, this is the dumbest thing I've ever seen. This is called Pet Chats. This is selling like crazy on Amazon. This is a connected device for lonely pets. You go to Amazon, you buy this, you hang it on the wall, connects to the Wi-Fi, you train your dog to put its wet nose against the screen, and this initiates a Skype call to the owner <laughs> at work so you can reassure your dog you'll be home soon. Crazy. And selling insanely on Amazon. These are connected pacifiers, tutus, streaming all the vital signs of your baby to your smartphone. I was at Philips a few weeks ago. They showed me, they proudly showed me their companion app for the new Razor. They, if you, if you, they have a companion app. And I said, but, but what does it do? What does a companion app do? And they said, it tells you when it's time to shave. And I thought, <laughs> I, I've been doing that all my life, huh? This is the dumbest thing, and then I'll stop. This is a connected IoT device that if you want to uncork another bottle, first you have to solve a puzzle on your smartphone to see if you're not too drunk to <laughs> unlock another bottle. Let me tell you, if you need an app to... I think you're too drunk. That would be my suggestion. What if we're only halfway there? And this is something that I find fascinating. I believe that you are better at seeing the day after tomorrow than some of your customers. But are you capable of really understanding what the full potential of IoT is going to be? Let me show you a video. It's, it's, it's 30 seconds. And this is a video that's from 1996, 22 years ago, when the World Wide Web and the Internet was just beginning to blossom. And this man is interviewed about the Internet, and he could see what we have today. And the journalist had no clue what he was talking about. Listen to this. I don't think we've even seen the tip of the iceberg. I think the potential of what the internet is going to do to society, both good and bad, is unimaginable. I think we're actually on the cusp of something exhilarating and terrifying. It's just a tool though, isn't it? No, it's not. No. Now it's an alien life form. What do you think, I mean, when you think then about the Is there life on Mars? <laughs> yes, it's just landed here. But that's, it's a simply a different delivery system there. You're arguing about something more profound. Oh yeah, I'm talking about the, the, the actual context and the state of content is going to be so different to anything that we can really envisage at the moment. Where the interplay between the user and the provider will be so in simpatico, it's going, to, it's going to crush our ideas of what mediums are all about. 
He could see 22 years ago what we have today. And it was clear the journalists couldn't. So I'm challenging you. If you see some of the technologies we're going to talk about, what is the consequence? And can you actually see what that day after tomorrow would be? And I think this is the main recipe of the next 10 years. It's a combination of platforms becoming more and more dominant, information becoming core, information turned into intelligence, and then automation. And it's almost like a cocktail. These are not individual technologies. They reinforce each other, and they make it stronger and better. And we now live in a world where platforms are becoming, in my opinion, probably the most dominant paradigm of the 21st century. And uh, what we like to do, what I like to do, is look at the people who are putting oil onto the fire. We love to work with a company called Andreessen Horowitz. They're a venture capitalist. They supply money for the next generation startups. It was founded by this man, Mark Andreessen, who, if you're old enough, he was the founder of Netscape. In, you know, in the 1990s, we would go online with a Netscape browser. Now he's one of the most important venture capitalists in Silicon Valley. And he wrote a brilliant article, Software is Eating the World. And he said, it's not tech for tech anymore. It used to be tech for tech. It was Intel making chips for Compaq. But now it's technology changing markets. And this is why we have these global phenomena that are going really, really fast. And it's because the network effects are accelerating. This is a slide from Andreessen. Um, it's now 100 times cheaper to do technology than it was 25 years ago. I started out my career by doing startups. And when I did startups in the 90s, I literally had to raise millions of euros just to get started. Servers, infrastructure, software. Now, anyone with a credit card is up and running in the cloud in a matter of minutes. And at the same time, if you're successful, you can grow and you see the network effects. And these network effects are positive feedback loops. And positive feedback loops means that we have a very strange phenomenon now called category kings. We have extreme dominant players. Perfect example, Google. Search, Europe, Google. What is the market share of search in Europe? Well, Google has 97% of the market. 97%. And who's number two? Nobody cares. That's category kings. And this is strange. In this digital world, we seem to have these network effects accelerating into category kings. And more and more, we have to figure out what is the role, not just your role, the role of your customers in a world where platforms become important. Are we Batman or Robin? Are we a platform? Are we a provider? And I get fascinated by this. Facebook is one of the most amazing companies in terms of growth. And this is my favorite graph. If you've read the book, you've seen this. This is the total number of SMSs of all the mobile operators on the planet. And this is the total number of messages on WhatsApp. And in 2010, if you would have asked the mobile operator, you know, given this, what's going to happen? Well, you would have gone to the Ardennes for three days and thought about this really hard and said, we think that's going to happen. Huh? And then, bam, that happens. What is the... The ghost in the telecom industry today, the whole dump pipe industry. You connect your customers, but do you really understand? You connect your customers, but do you capture the value? And today we see that these over-the-top players are extremely good at extrapolating that value. And they're constantly innovating. Facebook launched Messenger for Kids a few weeks ago. You have to be 14 years old to legally be on Facebook. That's why so many children are 14 years old on Facebook. Huh? So they launched Messenger for Kids. I mean, brilliant. But why didn't the other telco players actually do that? Could you guys have developed WhatsApp easily? I mean, WhatsApp wasn't such a very complex application to build. I think you could have built 15 WhatsApps. Maybe you did. Huh? I think we're in a situation now where it's not about the technological skills, is can you actually accelerate that into the market? And I really believe it has to do with the way we actually build companies. It's the way we organize ourselves, not just technology. If you look at Facebook, they are 
paranoid about being disrupted themselves. Every employee at Facebook gets this little red book, and on the very first page it says, if we don't create the thing that kills Facebook, somebody else wills. This is absolute paranoia being built in. Today, I think the most impressive of the tech giants is Amazon. Um, not just that they're getting into the physical world, but this is the growth of Amazon revenue-wise, and this is their profit. And um, there's a very strange thing about Amazon and profit. If Amazon makes a profit in a quarter, they panic. Um, recently, we've had that. The CEO, Jeff Bezos, said, um, we're really sorry, we made a profit. Um, this will never happen again. Um, we'll, f we'll fire the guy. Uh, we, we don't know what happened, but rest assured, we will never make a profit again. Uh, that's quite different from your reality. Yeah, I get that. But as a result, they're only playing for that long-term game. And they're not just getting bigger, they're getting much bigger than the rest. This is Amazon versus the other online retailers. Last year in the US, Amazon took two-thirds of all the growth in e-commerce was Amazon's. And this is now becoming an issue. If you look at retail in the US, more and more bankruptcies, more and more customers going out of business, malls that are becoming empty, we're beginning to see that we have a fundamental impact. The CEO of Liberty Global, uh, John Malone, recently called Amazon like a death star, moving in striking range of every industry on our planet. Maybe that's a little bit over the top, but it's very clear that these powerful players have an enormous sense of looking at the future. And this is the second video I want to show you. This is my favorite video. This is the founder of Amazon, Jeff Bezos, in 1997, when he was still happy to talk to a reporter. And he's asked about Amazon, and he uses the concept of day one for the first time. And 20 years later, at a company event like this, he is asked by his employees, what does day two look like? Look, watch this video. What is your claim to fame? <laughs> I'm the founder of Amazon.com. It's an exciting place to be on the web right now. Oh, it absolutely is. I mean, it's just incredible. This is what's really incredible about this is that this is day one. This is the very beginning. This is the Kitty Hawk stage of electronic commerce. What does day two look like? <laughs> Amazing. This is a company that is built on a culture of only looking at that day after tomorrow. And he says, if we actually lose the ball and we get into a routine, it's stasis, irrelevance, decline, and death. And this reminds me, of course, of On Death and Dying from Elizabeth Kubler-Ross. Are these companies vulnerable? They absolutely are. Are they a monopoly? Absolutely. If you look at it, this is the breakdown of the revenue of these tech giants. And you see that they are extremely vulnerable. They've grown very, very quickly. But look at it. I mean, a company like Google, 88% dependent on one product search. A company like Facebook, 97% on advertisement. A company like Amazon is a little bit more diversified. Apple, 63% one particular product which means that these companies are extremely vulnerable, but at the same time, they're extremely dominant. Shouldn't we break them up? In The Economist two weeks ago, there was a brilliant article about the fact that these companies have become too strong. These tech giants, the Amazons, the Googles, and the Facebooks, were compared to Standard Oil. Standard Oil was the company from Rockefeller that became the largest company in the world, and the US government broke it into smaller pieces because Standard Oil was seen as too big. And this brilliant article in The Economist said, 
Google is standard search, and Facebook is standard social, and Amazon is standard retail. We should break these companies up. Honestly, I think it will not happen. I had a chance uh, two weeks ago to be here in Brussels when the COO of uh, Facebook, Sheryl Sandberg, right there, um, actually was in Brussels. It was amazing to see how she was talking about the fake news and what she was going to do on Facebook to address that. The most interesting thing is when we started to talk about breaking up, it was very clear this is not going to happen because this is now a geopolitical game. And we're so used to our technology ecosystem that comes out of Silicon Valley, but at the same time we see stuff that is happening on the other side of our planet. And I've been going to China for the last three years, really observing how technology in China is progressing. And I can honestly say, Silicon Valley is being given a run for its money by the Chinese technology giants. And they are ultimately more sophisticated and, in my opinion, ultimately more dominant. If you want to understand China, this is the world's GDP for thousands of years. And this is the portion of China into the world's um, economy. And China was always one third of the world economy until the Industrial Revolution, where China dropped to 6% of world GDP. China completely lost the Industrial Revolution. And then, bam, they're now rebounding like crazy. The phenomenon that we hear very little about here in the West is called the New Silk Road, the Nieuwe Zijde Route. The New Silk Road is one belt, one road, where we actually have the huge economic expansion of China into Persia and into Eastern Europe, and the enormous economic expansion of uh, China into India and into Africa. This is, in my opinion, the largest economic expansion in the previous 300 years. And we hear almost nothing about it in our press. And what is interesting is the Chinese are taking their digital giants into the new Silk Road. Baidu used to be the search engine of China. Baidu is now the search engine of the new Silk Road. Alibaba is much more powerful than anything that Amazon has ever done. Singles Day a year ago, 17 billion. Singles Day last time, 25 billion. And it's not just B2B and B2C, it's everything in between. We see that they're putting up the same enterprise type of solutions out there. And what is really interesting, in my opinion, the strongest of the three is Tencent. This is the company that Carrefour is partnering with. Tencent is the owner of WeChat, and WeChat is the operating system of China. If you don't have Facebook on your smartphone in Europe, you're fine. If you don't have WeChat on your Facebook, on your smartphone in China, you cannot function in society. It is literally the operating system of China. I was in Shenzhen last year where I went into a haagen to buy an ice cream, and I made the mistake of when I had to pay to take out my credit card. And I was laughed out of the store. Taking out a credit card in China is, is medieval. It is just completely insane. It's like going to the Carrefour here and trying to pay for my groceries with a camel or a goat. That is the equivalent of taking out a credit card in China. And there you see, it is fascinating to see how mobile payments are not just accelerating, but at the same time, what the government knows about its citizens. Um, I honestly believe that if China is going to wake up, it is really, really going to open up our eyes. If Chinese go to Silicon Valley, they find the technology outdated compared to what they have in China. At the same time, we see very strange things. Every Chinese is going to have a three-digit code that tells how good of a citizen you are. And it will be based on the Tencent WeChat data. But not just the WeChat data. If you cross a red light, you have facial recognition and your points go down. I mean, imagine introducing that in Belgium. We cannot even imagine that this would happen, but this is the technology that becomes mainstream from the new Silk Road. And my point is, we seem to have like two ecosystems. We've got Google and Baidu. We've got Amazon and Alibaba. We've got Facebook and WeChat. We've got Uber and Didi. We've got Tesla and BYD. YouTube and Yukutudo. Apple and Xiaomi. And these two ecosystems is that today we are completely dependent on the Silicon Valley technology ecosystem, 
But now we're seeing that the East is moving in. Look at the Carrefour, Tencent. Look at Auchan and Alibaba. And I think in the next couple of years, we're going to see these two ecosystems actually playing out in the world of technology. The problem is, at this moment, is that in Europe, we are in between two fires. This is unicorns, startups with billion dollar valuation in the Silicon Valley ecosystem, and this is in the new Silk Road, and this is Europe. At this moment, I'm almost ashamed to say that we are rapidly losing out on the digital revolution in our continent. Where China missed out on the industrial revolution, we're going to have to work extra hard to make sure that we don't miss the world of digital. And the interesting thing is, we're now seeing that everything is about information. Information becomes absolutely core. Big data is everywhere. But what do you do with big data? Big data is meaningless unless you analyze it. Got a really interesting one. This is the famous alert that was sent out in Hawaii. Um, imagine getting that on your smartphone, that there is a missile about to hit your island. I would freak out. The most interesting big data example I've seen based on the Hawaii missile incident was actually the data of the log files of Pornhub, which is one of the largest porn sites in the world. And this is the average normal pornography traffic level that they had. And this is the moment that the missile alert came. What do you think happened the moment that people say, oh, you're going to be hit by a missile? Well, the, the porn news dropped dramatically, 77%. Yeah? But the most interesting thing is 32 minutes later, people said, oh, we'll be fine, which is a very interesting way of analyzing data and, and human behavior. Huh? Anyway, in the world of, of IT and information becoming core, huh, we've got to realize that we're now in a world where IT used to be a big T and a small I, and now IT is going to be a big I, a lot of information and a small T. And, and there are still many companies out there who are struggling with that. They are, they are struggling to reinvent you know, their digital assets or their digital capabilities. As a matter of fact, many companies, many of your customers are still digitizing their old analog processes instead of reinventing them for a world where digital becomes normal. I became fascinated by information. How do we manage information? How do you manage information? How do your customers manage information? We can talk about big data. Honestly, I'm, I see a lot of companies who can't even do small data. I became obsessed with how people organize information. I have no idea what you use. Do you use SharePoint? Well, or Google Drive or whatever you have. I can read your soul just by looking at your SharePoint. And not at the documents, that would be illegal, but just at how creative have you been with your folder names. And this has become a strange hobby for me. For the last 20 years, I've been collecting folder names of companies. I once went to a company where on the root directory of the SharePoint, I found the folder called, please don't delete, please, please. And I think this says something about a company. In a company where knowledge management was very important, I found this one. We found this stuff on Fred's hard drive when he left. Um, this is in a big multinational company, crap from headquarters that we have to keep. I mean, this gives me so much input into the inside of a company. And this is my favorite one. Delete this folder when the auditors come in. Well, uh, <laughs> fascinating. I think we're even confused by small amounts of data. But turning information into insights, and these companies do that brilliantly. These companies suck up information, analyze it, put it into use. And if we want to understand how to be relevant for customers, if we want to understand how to pick up the noise, how to interpret the signals and turn that into valuable assets, that is absolutely crucial. But sometimes we misinterpret that. Listen to this example. The numbers, they keep getting bigger and bigger. Clicks are off the charts. Yeah. Yosh, it's Walter. We're back. Yes, sir! I
Take a look at Woodfolk. Well, everything you got on Woodfolk right now. <laughs> this would never happen to you. We're now in a world where information is abundant. It's all about the individuals and there are no averages anymore. There are no average customers anymore. This is why people in marketing are often really confused. Marketing is a very simple thing. It didn't change for 50 years. You've got a brand and you need to get that out to your customers and you use the media. You would hire an ad agency who would pocket 15% and they would carpet bomb trying to hit a few customers out there. And that worked fine for 50 years until BAM, there's now a network in between. And how do you interpret the language of the network to be relevant for customers? And I'm fascinated by this, but people say, what a scary world. What about privacy? This big brother, these companies know so much about us. Honestly, I think it's part of a reality. This is probably the scariest company I've ever seen. Um, if you don't want to sleep tonight, Google this website, Cambridge Analytica. Cambridge Analytica is an, a really creepy company, and even the website itself is classic blue pill, red pill. I mean, you can click on commercial or political, and commercial blue, if you click on that, they say, we nudge audience behaviors. And they're hired by the Ogilvies who work for brands, and you're constantly nudging your user on social media to have a more favorable perception of a brand. Or you can click on red political, and then on the reference list on their website, they said, we got this clown elected in the White House. If you really don't want to sleep, Google Cambridge Analytica and Brexit, and you will find a brilliant Guardian article that says that not only did Cambridge Analytica get Trump in the White House, they were probably responsible for the Brits making the worst possible decision in their entire history. Is this scary? Yes. Is it reality? Yes. And I believe in a world where connectivity is a commodity, where information becomes essential, then I think trust is going to be the differentiating factor. And I'm not going to talk for a whole hour on blockchain. I honestly believe what happened 25 years ago could happen again. And what happened in consumer is going to happen in enterprise. The Economist calls this embryonic new technology the trust machine. The possibility of not just putting currencies out there and let's be honest last year was the year of the cryptocurrency Bitcoin has been going up and my god it's been going down <laughs> honestly it is irrelevant it only proves that the underlying technology blockchain actually works the Bitcoin blockchain has 10,000 nodes around the world constantly communicating and the most trusted network that we've ever built on this planet and now we say, hey, we can put other stuff instead of crazy Bitcoin onto this blockchain. Rights, for example. I love this example. This is a small startup called Bindit. I use hundreds of images in my presentation. I don't know who the author is. I just find them. I would like to pay the author. With Bindit, you can do that. If you're an author and you make an illustration or a picture, you upload it onto the blockchain, and it is included who the author and how to pay the author. And I, as a user, will be able to find it and know exactly what to do. And I believe the true future of this is when we start to put logic onto the blockchain, when we put apps onto a distributed database. Many companies are working with that. And even in the field of IoT, I honestly believe the potential we're going to have of putting distributed applications into a trusted network that, in my opinion, is going to be a huge opportunity for all of us. But what do we see? We're now starting to turn information into intelligence. And we've seen the signs. 20 years ago, Kasparov was defeated by IBM Deep Blue, and Deep Blue could only, only play chess. It was built to play chess, and it could only play chess. And now we have general purpose AI. Machines, networks, that we can train for anything. Two years ago, Lee Sodol was defeated by um, DeepMind. DeepMind is Google's deep neural AI network. 
This man is relatively unknown to us, but in North Korea, and sorry, in Korea, South Korea, he's the absolute hero. This is the, this is the Eddie Merckx of Korea. I mean, he's like a hero. And he was defeated by a machine, by a network, and he was deeply unhappy about that. 2017, he asked for a rematch. Um, in 2017, they've played 53 rematches, and Google won 52. In the 53rd, something magical happened. Some IT guy tripped over a wire and accidentally pulled the plug on DeepMind. And they said, should we call it a draw? And he said, yep, draw is fine. Yeah, draw is fine. Hmm? Fundamental to see what is happening. This is Libratus. This is the deep learning AI from Carnegie Mellon put in front of four of the best poker players last year, and Libratus cleared their pockets. The machine was not only able to do a better move, was able to bluff and lie better than the humans. And then it becomes interesting. I honestly believe we're going to be training AIs all the time. Which one of you trained in AI today? If you used Waze like me to get here, you've trained in AI. If you used Facebook, you've trained in AI. Anything we do on platforms is loading data to train AIs. And we're rapidly in a situation where almost anything that we can do as humans is probably going to be done more efficiently by algorithms. This is the Microsoft Skype translator, year and a half old. You download the app, you speak in your language, and it's automatically translated into the language of your counterpart. And a year and a half ago, that was like, wow. Huh? And then just before Christmas, Google launches their Pixel Buds, wireless earphones with 40 natural language translations built in. You're going to China, and they will speak Mandarin. It's translated in your language in your ears. And people say, ah, but Google Translate sucks. Huh? Yeah. Three years ago, Google Translate sucked. Two years ago, it was terrible. A year ago, it was bad. Now it's meh. And the more we train them, the better it gets. And I think this is interesting. This is my favorite one. Try this one. This is auto draw. I do this with my kids. This is for people who suck at drawing. Huh? You draw something and it says, Bedul the da. It's a, it's a very interesting <laughs> recommendation engine. Huh? which is absolutely fabulous. And the more we use it, the more we train it, the better it gets. And the only people who don't like that are the clip art people. I mean, the people who make these illustrations are basically being disrupted. But honestly, this type of technology is going to be built in, into AutoCAD. Every, every architect out there who is designing an apartment of a Fermetican is going to say, do you mean that? Yeah, actually, I mean that. I'm an engineer. Honestly, anything we can design is going to be augmented with intelligence. Uh, anything electronical is going to be augmented. Even coding. I mean, we get to the point in life where today we say, oh, coding, that's the job of the future. Maybe that's going to be the blue collar worker of tomorrow. Does it mean we have to fear? We have to be realistic. People say, oh, this is all science fiction. I say, no, I take this image. Everybody knows this image. This is the Wright brothers, Kitty Hawk, North Carolina, 1903. And people said, this is, where we, this is where we learned how to fly. No, this is where we did it. We learned it because some guy, Bernoulli, 150 years before the Wright brothers, described exactly how the mathematics work, how the flow over a wing actually creates lift. And what did the Wright brothers do? They put a 12 horsepower engine onto a wing. And 150 years after Bernoulli's law, boom, it made it fly. And now you take a plane like you take a bus. For the last 65 years, we've known exactly how to make machines that think. We've known exactly how to make algorithms that can learn themselves. Only now, we have the horsepower. We now have the 12 horsepower engine to be able to make this happen. And I get really excited about this. Should we be scared? No. But I think we do have to realize we are exactly at that particular point in time. We are exactly in the Wright Brothers 1903. What does it mean for you? Well, um, some people say, could this be used against us? We're talking about weapons of math destruction, algorithms. This is um, the CEO of Google, Eric Schmidt, who said, if you look at China, 
In 2020, the Chinese are as good as the US at AI. 2025, they will be better. 2030, they will dominate the industries. We're rapidly going into an environment where AI and automation is going to have a huge effect. And I think this is the classic ui and wow. I, I meet a lot of wonderful startups doing amazing stuff and sometimes crazy stuff. This is one of the weirdest things I've seen. These guys have built a golf robot and you put the robot onto any course. It looks at the topology of the terrain, looks at the wind patterns and then calculates what it needs to do to do a hole in one on every, every hole. I mean, what we do as humans is just an approximation of what robots can do. Um, the, uh, the industry was not amused by that. Huh? We've seen Atlas grow up. Two and a half years ago, um, all Atlas could do was open up a door. And even when this video came out two and a half years ago, it said, oh wow, opening a door. Huh? I mean, honestly, we've been trained Atlas. Here, Atlas is being trained to stack boxes in, in, in Carrefour. Um, but this created a storm on the internet. This is George, this is the robot trainer. And first we say, oh, George is a nice guy, huh? um, a hipster dude, beard and everything. Huh? And after a while we say, is he training the robot or is he actually bullying the robot? Is he, is he pesting the robot? And after a while we, we, we get genuine empathy with, with these devices. Um, very soon a meme appeared where the feelings of the robot were visualized, where the sentiments of the robot were actually shown, and where you get real, genuine empathy for the device. And, and certainly when that happens, eh, you would, oh, you, you, you would totally understand this type of behavior. <laughs> and then just before the summer, a magical video came out where um, Atlas is being asked to run a parkour. And honestly, I couldn't run this parkour. I'm 48, I'd probably stumble and fall. But the fascinating thing is, if you see in two and a half years how quickly it has evolved, what incredible nuances, and that magical moment when it makes a backflip, and then zijn handjes omhoog, is really, really cool. Huh? This is, I think, one of those pivotal moments in that transition where you begin to realize, what if we're only halfway there in a transition where this technology becomes absolutely mainstream? Um, a year ago, the first self-driving truck delivered 50,000 cans of Budweiser beer over a 200-mile journey. We're now beginning to see that in the press, we have a lot of people saying, oh, the robots are going to take our jobs. And, and when will an algorithm be employee of the month? Huh? Honestly, we've been talking about this for a very long time. But maybe we have to realize that this is not about technology, it's about psychology and technology. This is the latest um, data um, that is coming out of MIT. This is, this is your salary, and this is very unlikely to be replaced by robots in the next 20 years, and this is highly likely to be replaced by robots. And as I said, it's not technology, it's psychology. We make irrational choices. One of the number one jobs that will not disappear in the next 20 years is surgeons. This is stupid. You get a brain tumor, and as a patient you have a choice. Are you going to use a laser precision robot or some guy with shaky hands? And we say, oh, do my dinner man's me saying trill in the hodges. Crazy, absolutely ludicrous. CEOs have no chance of being replaced, huh? which is good news. But look over there. I mean, auditors and accountants have a 94% chance of being automated in the next 20 years. I'm, I'm doing a presentation on Monday for Deloitte. I can't wait to use that data. Eh? <laughs> and again, psychology. There are a lot of jobs here. I mean, we're never going to give our baby to a robot to raise them, which again is stupid. If you would give your baby to a robot, by the time you know, your daughter is 12, she will speak seven languages, and one of them will be Python. I mean, that's, that's the situation. But here we're going to have a lot of jobs, and maybe they're not going to disappear. I love what the CEO of IBM said, maybe only 10% of jobs will disappear, but 100% will change. And this is where we get into that day after tomorrow societal consequences. Honestly, almost anything that is on this chart is going to be both ui and wow, utopian and dystopian. 
I mean, AI and machine learning, I, I can't wait. I mean, driving here in, in the snowstorm, uh, uh, where I live, to Zaventem is a two-hour traffic jam on Monday morning. I would love to just watch Netflix or read a book. Brussels, not my favorite city to park. Huh? I would love to get out here and tell my car, pick me up around six o'clock. Just drive around, just Uber yourself, make some money, be useful. That would be fantastic. Huh? This is utopia. But at the same time, we see this idea of machines smarter than us is a pretty scary idea. I think we're going to see almost in every possible direction. If you look at Internet of Things and 3D printing, robotics, it could lead us into an amazing fourth industrial revolution. At the same time, we're going to see a shift in jobs. And are we prepared for that? Do we have politicians which are preparing us for that? If you look at the potential of the blockchain, amazing new business models. But if you thought a computer virus was scary, think about the unbounded malignant complexity that could result out of this. And even AR and VR. Honestly, it's not just games. Think about what it could do for education. But at the same time, where it has amazing things, it could also be extremely addictive. So this is your recipe for the next 10 years. You have stuff in your hands that are both wow and ooey. And what are you going to do with your customers? Your customers that are going through big changes and that are uncertain about where the future is going to be. This is the traditional chart. Um, traditional companies are going to see a lot of new challengers. And here you think, bah. And there you think, oh, fuck. And the, the time between meh and oh, fuck just gets shorter and shorter. And I think this is the type of conversations you need to have with your customers. How are you going to convince them to see the potential of new ideas? And of course, I don't have to talk about you know, the day after tomorrow to you guys. Many companies out there are really struggling with this. And today is something that eats up a lot of our time. But the biggest problem is not today. The biggest problem is tomorrow. Look at budgets. This is one of my favorite illustrations of tomorrow thinking. I love budgets. I love watching companies go through a budget exercise. This is a yearly sadistic ritual that we do, like Christmas, where we put in imaginary numbers into Excel that we consolidate into something which never works, but we do it every year. And almost every single time we look at tomorrow with what we know today. Instead of really looking at that day after tomorrow with new ideas and new business models and new technologies. And many companies are in the 9370 and they're destroying a huge amount of long-term value. And it's a true story. When I had written the book with that model, I went to Australia, did a workshop, and the CEO of this company put that big red box with the shit of yesterday on it and said, this creates negative value. And I rewrote the book because I think it is important to address the shit of yesterday. But I added something to it. This is not in the book. I came to a very strange conclusion. I'm, I'm, I'm almost 50 and then you start to reflect on your life. What have I learned? And I've come to a very strange conclusion is I think there are only two types of people in the world. There are people who know what they're doing and there are people who don't know what they're doing. And bear with me. And if I would ask you to raise your hand right now, who in this room has no idea what they're doing, it's not socially accepted to raise your hand. And yet, I think these people are crucial. Now, let me explain. In my opinion, the king of people who don't know what they're doing is this man. I think he's the absolute God because he's constantly doing things that have never been done before. So by definition, he doesn't know what he's doing. If he says, I'm going to land the rocket vertically on a barge in the ocean with nine meter waves, there are thousands of engineers at NASA who say, you can't do that. And he says, which is brilliant. Huh? And if I look at it, he's constantly pushing the limits. He's constantly actually addressing the fact that how can they push people to do things that have never been done before? 
He's constantly addressing new markets and doing that. And the nice thing about startups, and I've spent my life in startups, is that if you're in a startup, you have 99% people who don't know what they're doing. And maybe you have 1% who thinks they know what they're doing. This is like a serial entrepreneur or a, a gray-haired investor or no-haired investor. Huh? But you need 99% people who are constantly doing stuff that's never been done before. And if companies start to grow, that ratio changes. You go to Facebook, it's 50-50. You go to Google, it's becoming a boring traditional company. And then two days ago, I had to present to a bank, big Belgian bank. And then I come in and I realize there are 99% people there who know what they're doing. And they've done it that way for 37 years. And then yesterday, there was an insurance company that's even more challenging, in my opinion. But let's look at those odds. In a traditional company, you've got 99% of people who know what they're doing. And I love to work with these guys. The people who are pushing the envelope, the people who are really, truly innovating. But the problem with most companies is these people don't innovate all the time. They spend an insane amount of energy fighting the 99%. And I believe that's the challenge we need to overcome. And for that, innovation has to be something that is in every core of every employee of an organization. It's not just a plan, it's a dream. It's about allowing yourself to dream what that day after tomorrow could be. And if you look at innovation, many companies say, oh, product, product, we should look at product. And this is something companies have a product bias. And product innovation, ah, brilliant. I mean, look at this. I've been using this the entire time. This is, this is a product innovation. Honestly, this is the Logitech Spotlight, buy one. It is absolutely fascinating. I've been using clickers my entire career, and it's always the same. Forward, backward, root punching. Forward, backward, root punching. Always the same. And then some guy just puts a gyroscope in it, and you think, wow, why didn't we think of that before? Huh? Absolutely brilliant, simple. Huh? Apple is the king of that. To introduce a product, to introduce a category, and keep on refining that. Absolutely genius. And sometimes product launches can be catastrophic. For the older people in the room, 1985, Coke launches new Coke. And it was undrinkable. Gewoon niet te zuipen. And he launches new Coke, and the users hated it. They said, bring back the old. It was on the cover of Time magazine. And after huge protests from customers, Coke said, okay, we listen to you. We'll bring back classic Coke. And they sold more Coke than ever before. And now marketeers say, oh, what a brilliant strategy. You could try this. Huh? You could bring out some products that are so shitty that your customers are going to be really glad to get the old stuff back. That would be fantastic. Huh? I wouldn't recommend it. Now we see people say, oh, new markets. We have to look at adjacencies, new types of markets that we can expand into. And this is where companies make huge mistakes. My favorite story, and I love this. In 1993, Colgate, if I, if I say Colgate, you say toothpaste. And the management team at Colgate had every single flavor of toothpaste that you can imagine. And I had no idea what they were smoking in the executive team in 1993. But you could just imagine what that management team said, always oh, the toothpaste, let's do something new. New market, yes, new market, let's expand into a new market. Do you know which market they expanded into? Lasagna. Can you even imagine the idea? There's a hint of toothpaste in your lasagna, it would be ludicrous. You only have to do it with your core strengths. Look at Tesla and how they are using markets and addressing markets. My favorite example, again, is Amazon. Amazon Web Services, I mean, Amazon is by far the largest online retailer in the West. It is also the largest cloud provider out there. Same core strengths, being able to outrun Google and IBM and Oracle, hugely profitable. That is market expansion and innovation that makes sense. But some of your customers can do amazing things with technology just in service innovation. Just using digital to really have the same product but different service innovation. 
Look at Netflix. We all are huge fans of Netflix. Netflix started out as a DVD online business. You would rent a DVD, Dances with Wolves, somebody would stuff it into an envelope, send it to you. Mail order DVDs. And then in 2003, some IT guys came out of the basement and said, uh, why don't we stream it? Can, can you imagine the discussion in the boardroom? What do you mean, stream it? No? I mean, now it's become a verb. Same Dances with Wolves, service innovation, different delivery. My favorite company last year, McDonald's. This is the stock of McDonald's. Their stock went up by 47%. And you know what? They did service innovation, same hamburgers. But have you been in a McDonald's recently? Have you seen these interactive kiosks? They're brilliant. If you're a parent and you've ever been in a crowded McDonald's at the counter with three kids and one doesn't like pickles and one doesn't like ketchup, it's the most stressful thing I've ever done in my entire life. Solved service innovation. Customers are more efficient, staff is more efficient, and then what they did brilliantly, the cooperation with Uber Eats, they sell more hamburgers than ever before. Same hamburgers, different service innovation. Absolutely brilliant. My favorite one is TaskRabbit. TaskRabbit is an amazing website where you find people to do simple stuff. You need to hang a kaderken on your wall, you have two left hands, who can do that? TaskRabbit. You need to change the wheel of your car, two left hands, TaskRabbit. What was the number one task people searched for last year on TaskRabbit? Putting together IKEA furniture. <laughs> so what happened in December? IKEA buys TaskRabbit. That is brilliant service innovation. Same core product, different service. And then of course, yeah, you know, Amazon, again, look at Amazon Prime. But today we're all dreaming of that business model innovation. But that's just one of those elements. We, we're dreaming of disrupting how Kindle disrupted how we read or how iTunes changed the way we think about music. And this is something that many companies will have to go through, but it's a more difficult challenge. I was at BMW in January where BMW realized they're not just going to be selling cars. They're going to be figuring out how to do mobility as a service. They need to offer that capability. This is yellow cabs in New York City. This is Uber. We know where that is going. They have to fundamentally change their model to buy into this as a service. And that is a radical business transformation for a company like BMW. Two weeks ago, I had a chance to be with Rolls-Royce who make the aircraft engines. You've only got two really big ones, GE and Rolls-Royce. These guys are using data, are using sensors, are using IoT to no longer sell engines, but provide power by the hour. Radical change in new business models. Those are excellent examples. So I have no idea what you're going to do. But you're up against companies who are probably more agile. And I think you have no challenge with technology. But your challenge might be in the agility. This is why I love startups. I mean, you, in Silicon Valley, you can start in a garage and build Hewlett Packard. You can start in a garage and build Apple. You can start in a garage and build Google. It's clear if you don't have a garage, you're a loser. You absolutely need to have a garage. But this idea of the plantation and the rainforest is very real. I mean, these startups live in, in an environment that is messy and scary. And these rules of the rainforest are fundamentally different. I mean, the plantation analogy that's in the book is something that I absolutely love. If you run a banana plantation, you wake up every morning, you say, banan, and you drive to work thinking about bananas. You, you, you probably listen to podcasts about bananas. You have meetings about bananas. You, you write emails about bananas. You probably have three-day off-sites in the Ardennes to think about banana budget next year. And this is the scary part, that you get blindsided. And this is why I believe we have to fundamentally change the fabric of organizations. We, we, we've got to rethink structures. Today, when you try and introduce new ideas, this is the magical formula for the resistance to new ideas. It's a function of the number of employees to the power of the number of managers. Huh? And this is why we have org charts that just, you know, you've, you've got the one percenters, but are you really still capable of getting it out? I mean, 
Are you creating that creative chaos to let that rain? And this is the irony of my job. I take executives to Silicon Valley, and then something strange happens. We visit these startups, and these executives say, Am I good? Is it not palatin? And they, they bring their dog to work, and they have meetings around a ping pong table, and, and, and more dogs. And these people go back and say, we need more dogs. And I say, no, wrong conclusion. This fundamental shift of a fluid organization, that agility that you were talking about earlier, I think is essential to make it work. And I get excited by that because more than technology, it's a mindset. This is probably my favorite startup of the moment. It's called Planet Labs. Four years old, started by this guy, and they make shoebox satellites. Very tiny satellites. And what you have in your smartphone is inside these satellites. They use secondary payload. So if somebody launches a satellite, you say, oh, we just have two shoeboxes. Can we just shoot them out? And inside, they are just using off-the-shelf smartphone technology with very good lenses. And it's about speed. What they do is once they're launched, they now have 200 of these satellites around the world. They start to rasterize the entire image of the Earth. And every night, they have a full batch. If you go to Google Earth, look at your house. It's three months old, three years old or older. They have accurate data every single night. And they don't sell the images. They sell the insight. What they know is amazing. They have the best accuracy of anything that has ever been developed. They see crops growing, calculate soybean futures, and sell it to the hedge funds. They understand economic activity. They see ships being loaded and unloaded and sell it to the investment funds. They understand erosion and ecology and sell it to governments. And I love this company. I love this image. What you see here is the project they worked on at NASA. This took 17 years to get into space. This is what they do, shoebox satellites that have off-the-shelf technology. 17 years, that's like putting a Commodore 64 into orbit. And I believe this shows one thing. It's not about technology. It's this mindset of speed. So let me wrap this up. One of the things that I fundamentally believe, is if companies really want to reinvent themselves on this day after tomorrow, it's a fundamental question about how much do you control your comfort zone, and how much are you willing and daring to reinvent yourself for that day after tomorrow? And I won't make myself popular, but I always joke with the audit committee. You know? Big companies, good governance. Good governance, audit committee. Who are the people on the audit committee of a company? By definition, the most boring, risk-averse people in the company. Huh? And um, you need them because you need people to follow the rules and color inside the lines. I would argue every company that has an audit committee should have a counterweight, a disruption committee filled with people who are constantly saying, why don't we color outside of the lines? And I think it boils down to one thing. Are you willing to not just have a little bit of chaos? Are you willing to try stuff? Are you willing to really experiment? I love this quote from Mandela. I never fail. I either win or I learn. And it's easy to like that. It's bloody difficult to put that into practice when you go to work on Monday morning. And I think you need inspiration. I meet a lot of amazing people. This is probably one of the coolest people I've ever met in my entire life. This is a guy called Andrei Geim, Russian-born uh, physicist. And he won the Nobel Prize Physics in 2010. And I met him two years ago. And he's a really curious guy because he won the Nobel Prize Physics in 2010 for his discovery of graphene. And as you know, the Nobel Prize gets awarded to the smartest physicist in the world. But he also won the Ig Nobel Prize Physics in 2000, which is awarded to the dumbest physicist in the world. And this man is the only person who has won both awards in his life. And what happened is he won the Nobel Prize Physics in 2010 for his work on graphene. And graphene is the material of the future, 200 times stronger than steel, superconductor, perfect layer of carbon atoms, just amazing. And we've known about it since the 1960s, but we couldn't make it. 
but he won the Ig Nobel Prize Physics in 2000 because of a frog. And let me explain. This is his motto. It's better to be wrong than to be boring. And that says something. And he does a very strange thing. He teaches physics at the University of Manchester, Friday to, Monday to Friday. And on Friday night at 8 o'clock, he closes the lab. He invites his best students into the laboratory, gives them serious amounts of alcohol, and says, just try stuff. Just experiment. And this sometimes gets out of hand. And in 2000, something happened. They, they had rigged up a superconducting magnet, so a superconductor magnet, and they had a drop of water inside that was anti-gravity. And they, they got a little drunk and they upped the game and they said, let's loan a frog from the biology laboratory. And they threw it in and it became the first anti-gravity frog in the world. And um, anyway, uh, scientific achievement, um, but he almost got thrown out of the university. He got him the Ig Nobel Prize Physics in 2000. And 10 years later, when he got the Nobel Prize Physics, he said, it happened in exactly the same circumstances. We, we went into the lab, we got drunk, and we figured out if you take scotch tape, a rollicalaxcus, huh, and you take the sticky part of scotch tape, you take a pencil, graphite, and you strike it, you get a perfect flake of graphene. And we've known about it since the 60s, but we couldn't make it until we were quite drunk one Friday night. So what's my point? I think you should drink more. That is, that is a fundamental thing, which, uh, thank you. Uh, I started with this, I'm going to end with this. Best of times, worst of times, the full intro is even more beautiful. You're going to see more scary and wow things than ever in your life in the next 10 years. And more than that, you're going to have to work with your customers to figure out what is best and what is worst, what is wow and what is ooey, what is scary and what is amazing. You're going to see more wisdom and foolishness. Hype and reality. You're going to be the guiding light to help your customers figure out how to make sense of this amazing opportunities of technologies. You will be the guy to say what is true and what is foolish. But it is the epoch of belief, the season of light, the spring of hope, and the winter of despair. I can only wish you a lot of success in the day after tomorrow. And I will leave you with four questions. When you really go back, think about this. In this shit of yesterday, day after tomorrow, how can you tip that balance and make the most of your day after tomorrow time. In this 99% and 1%, what could you do to boost the one percenters of your company even more? In this rainforest and plantation, what could you actually do to make sure that you put some of that rainforest magic into the banana plantation? And finally, in this control and relevance, what could you do and who would you put on your disruption committee? I wish you a lot of success in the day after tomorrow. Thank you very much. Thank you.